This is the Wow Signal Podcast, a podcast produced by the Dream of the Open Channel. Welcome. It's January 2015, and this is your host, Paul Carr. This is episode 10 of season 2. And since Venus exploration has been in the news lately with the publication of NASA Langley's Havoc study that showed the feasibility of human missions to the Venus atmosphere, I thought we should talk about that planet, what we know about it, what we don't know, and how we might learn more. I've had two scientists on the show before who happened to be experts on Venus exploration, so I contacted them and they agreed to appear to talk about this topic, which I don't think gets enough attention. The scientists are astrobiologist David Grinspoon and NASA scientist and mission architect Jeffrey Landis. Both are expert science communicators Jeffrey Landis through his award-winning fiction and David through his highly praised non-fiction books, Venus Revealed and Lonely Planets. Jeffrey was on Season 1, Episode 2, talking about his thinking on the Fermi Paradox, and David was on Season 1, Episode 4, talking about astrobiology and the prospects for finding life in various known environments in the solar system and beyond. I hope that if you haven't listened to those episodes before, that you will take the time to go back and do so. The intervening two years have done little to erode the content we provided then. Why is Venus important? You're about to hear that from the experts, and they have some compelling reasons, but from my perspective, it's mostly from the point of view of the history of life on Venus. Was there ever life there? And if so... Did it arise there or arrive from Earth or Mars? Could there be life there now? David Grinspoon was co-author of a paper a few years ago in which a plausible mechanism for life to survive in the Venus atmosphere was put forth. We don't know if there is life there, but it is one of the primary reasons I personally want to see exploration there. Note that we're not talking about colonization on Venus, a population of humans living there permanently, most likely in the clouds of other planets since the surface is so inhospitable. That's for another show, maybe next season. Here our scope is exploration, going to Venus to try to understand the origin, evolution, and dynamics of this very different planet that is most like Earth of any we know. Just a few facts about Venus, in case you are new to this topic. Venus is the second planet from the Sun, and our planet is the third, so it's a fair bit closer to the Sun, and the Sun is about 90% brighter at Venus than it is at the Earth. Venus is a little smaller and lighter than Earth and has a bit less surface gravity, although about the same density, so it's made of similar stuff. Here are two of the weird things about Venus. It has a very dense, very hot atmosphere. And it is not only rotating very slowly, taking 243 Earth days to rotate about its axis one time, but it is rotating upside down, or backwards, depending on how you prefer to think of it. As we're about to hear, there are other things about Venus that we'd like to understand a lot better. I had David on Skype and Jeffrey Landis on a landline, and the audio quality on neither was perfect, but I think you'll be able to hear them clearly with some very brief exceptions. David Grinspoon is senior scientist at the Planetary Science Institute and a member of the Venus Express mission science team. He is also a member of the Mars Curiosity rover science team and has held the astrobiology chair at the Library of Congress. He is also a member of NASA's Venus Exploration Analysis Group, or VEXAG. Jeffrey Landis 
is a scientist at NASA Glenn in Cleveland, Ohio, and an award-winning science fiction author. He is a member of the Mars Exploration Rover science team, and among his many other accomplishments, he has studied Venus surface and atmosphere missions for NASA. We'll have links in the show notes at wowsignalpodcast.com, where you can learn much more about our guests and what they do, including Jeff's poetry and David's music. Since we just we just sort of had an event having to do with Venus, which was the end of the Venus Express mission, and yet I, I'm I'm still hearing that it's still alive. David, could you update us on how Venus Express is doing? And yeah, it's in a kind of limbo state now because the uh, spacecraft is still there orbiting Venus, but the mission is over in the sense that we're no longer in control of the spacecraft uh, and we've given up trying to regain control. Uh, it's basically out of fuel and um, sometime probably in the next week or two it is expected to take the plunge into the atmosphere where its uh, atoms will become a permanent part of the planet that it's been studying for the last eight years. Um, and and um, so, uh, yeah, it was, uh, you know, it was going through these maneuvers um, in December. Uh, actually, I guess it was in the end of November. Um, it was going through a series of burns to raise the, the orbit to try to keep going for another uh, six months. Um, and, uh, you know, there was a little drama because we didn't really know how much fuel was left. It's, uh, you know, sort of like in your car, the gauge is, is very inaccurate and you sort of know that you're getting low, but you don't really know when you're going to run out. Um, and, uh, so we had hoped to make it through these 10 burns, um, and then buy several more months of operational lifetime. But about halfway through that series of burns, um, the spacecraft suddenly stopped communicating and was in a weird orientation and couldn't orient itself towards earth and um we feared the worst and it was the worst apparently it, it ran out of fuel and there was at that point there was no saving the mission so now it's, it's strange that it's still there and it can still actually be heard faintly through the um uh, you know the antenna that's not pointing at earth the the uh the the more uh, the lower power uh, omnidirectional antenna but um it's uh it's gonna die soon and there's nothing we can do so uh, other than uh, appreciate the fact that it's been a really great very successful mission and in fact it lasted a lot longer than um it had originally been uh you know had originally been planned so uh, in that sense it's not a tragedy losing it. from the venus express mission and sort of in the the era of venus express uh what what's new in terms of venus science what what do we what can we check off our list or do we just have more questions <laughs> um there are a few things we can check off, but it's mostly more questions. Um, a lot of the accomplishments were um, sort of incremental, uh, very important accomplishments uh, because uh, in a large sense, it was the, our first opportunity to make kind of long-term, in-depth observations of what is a very complex and changeable environment. You can think of it as our first weather satellite, uh, Venus, and think of how important weather satellites have been on Earth in terms of really learning the, the patterns and the complexity of the Earth system. Well, we're, we're starting to do the same with the Venus system. So, you know, a lot of what we've gained are these more detailed uh, maps of the clouds and the motions of the atmosphere and how they change and how the, the uh, chemistry of the atmosphere in detail um, changes over time. And so, I mean, you can list a few aha discoveries, and they are significant, like um, the first really definitive evidence for lightning in the atmosphere of Venus, and the uh, discovery of these really strange uh, polar vortices, which sort of chaotically dance around the poles, these, these permanent um, vortices, very dramatic features. Um, and, and, and also the, um, perhaps the first good evidence of active volcanism on the surface, although that is still subject to interpretation, but it's it's looking 
Um, like there's more and more support for active volcanism, and, and a lot of that's come from Venus Express. So you can take off these accomplishments, but but honestly, a lot of it is um, you know not subject to these sort of aha lists of discovery because it's a much more in depth set of data about the uh, more subtle changes and it's too important in, in feeding our ability to do decent climate of Venus, which of course, among many other things, are important in feeding our ability to do decent climate models of the Earth. You wrote, or you, you co-wrote a paper a number of years ago talking about the uh, the chemistry of the Venus atmosphere and it might have some astrobiological implications. Is there any update to that from what we learned? You know, there wasn't any um, dramatic discovery that um, confirmed or refuted the um, outlandish, but I maintain plausible notion of a possible biosphere in the you know at, at cloud level on Venus. But there there was a lot uh, again, sort of incrementally, we learned about the chemistry um, at those altitudes. You know, indeed, there is a lot of chemical disequilibrium. That is still somewhat unexplained at those altitudes, and indeed there is um, a fair amount of stability in the cloud particles in certain regions of the atmosphere. So, um, to the extent that there is a case to be made for the plausibility of potential cloud life on Venus, I feel that um, that was, um, if anything, sort of confirmed by this mission. But, um, it, you know, it wasn't uh, the kind of mission one would uh, like to send if one were really going to um, examine the, the cloud level environment in, in detail. And I, when we get to Jeff Landis, he'll have some, you know, to the extent that it addressed that question, I would say that it uh, continued um, my sense of the plausibility uh, uh, and the desirability to investigate that cloud level environment. Um, in, in situ, uh, you know, in, in, in with actual me- instruments that can go there rather than remote observing when we have the opportunity to do that. Now, now Jeff, I know you've you've uh, studied various atmospheric vehicles in Venus. Uh, there, there are airplanes, balloons. Uh, <laughs> what, what, what do you think is the, the most promising approach? Well, it depends on whether we're talking promising for the near term or promising for the long term. In the near term, I'm quite enthusiastic about atmospheric exploration of Venus. Uh, I think that today we have technology. We could enter the Venus atmosphere. Uh, we could fly around with airplanes. Uh, we could drift around with balloons. Uh, we could do some just absolutely magnificent uh, atmospheric science uh, floating in the atmosphere of Venus. Uh, it's, in fact, a, a beautiful place. What, interestingly, we've been learning from Venus Express is the atmosphere of Venus is a bit more dynamic than we'd originally thought. Uh, I guess from the earlier missions that were comparatively short-term, uh, I had a picture of Venus as a, a planet where the weather is always the same and it never changes. Uh, but Venus Express has shown us, well, things do change in Venus. It is a uh, a dynamic and interesting atmosphere. But, uh, you know, I think we could fly airplanes, we could fly to really, uh, go into the atmosphere and uh, really learn about it. Yeah, I know you also studied uh, surface rovers. Is that more in the in the far future? or surface of Venus is tough. We could go back to the surface of Venus. Of course, the Russians have been to the surface. Right. Uh, the bad news is their <clears throat> longest live mission was a little bit over two hours. Uh, we could beat that record if we wanted to. Uh, but what would be really exciting is putting a, a rover down to Venus that had all of the capability of the rovers we send to Mars. And in the future, one that's even better than the rovers we send to Mars is get down and start exploring. That's going to take a little bit of technology development. Yeah. It's not, it's not going to take any advances in physics. We know how to do it, uh, but we've got to take these technologies that are in the lab uh, and people are tinkering with at sort of a small scale and adapt them to the Venus environment and test them out. We're just putting a new Venus chamber uh, into operation at NASA Glenn, uh, a 
chamber that's big enough that we can actually put some of these things into it and see if we can get technology operating for uh, weeks or months or potentially even years on Dina. So we're going to try and get some of that technology ready to go. Is the biggest challenge the temperature? Or? The combination of temperature and high pressure together make it really hard. Uh, we can deal with the temperature, but when you put the high pressure on, on it makes it worse. Uh, of course, all of the problems of thermal insulation I get very hard when you're talking almost 100 times the Earth's atmospheric density. It's a, a tough problem. Hmm. Uh, and the chemical attack is not making things easier. No. Uh, now, does this involve, uh, if I understood your study correctly that you wrote a few years ago about a, sort of a Venus exploration architecture, you had... Um, you basically put all the smarts up in in an airplane or a balloon. Is that? Am I getting that right? Yeah, that's the approach that I, I like very much. We can make high temperature electronics that operate all the way at the Venus temperature, but when we do these, they're very primitive electronics by modern standards. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we can't even make something as sophisticated as your well as your dumb phone. Not to mention your smartphone. Right. So the electronics we can make that work at Venus temperatures are pretty much limited to very simple transistors, and we can make radios, but we can't make a you know very sophisticated Bluetooth connection. So we can do stuff on Venus, but a sophisticated computer is a little bit hard. So my thinking for that is well, we'll put the sophisticated computer uh, up where it's cooler, and it can run the rover. And then the rover is really just a remote control car. So it doesn't have a whole lot of smarts. It just does what you tell it. Mm -hmm. So, okay, let's back up a little bit and ask uh, both of you, uh, what are the big scientific questions we're trying to resolve at Venus? Uh, and... You know, looked looked at from the point of view of, of someone who's not a specialist on Venus, uh, is what 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 we what can we learn and what does it mean? Well, I have a whole list, David. Do you want to start or should I? Go? <laughs> yeah, I'm sure uh, we both have a long list, and I'm sure there are a lot of um, items uh, that are that are the same on our list. I mean, in terms of categories, I mean there are there are these big evolutionary questions um, mm -hmm. that are very important because. Venus is um, still our, um, you know, our only, well, it will no longer for long be our only um, example of a, you know, a, a twin to, to Earth in terms of size and density. Um, but for the foreseeable future, it'll be the only Earth-sized planet we can study in great detail. I think that's a safe statement. And... Um, you know, so there's there all these evolutionary questions about the divergence between Earth and Venus that will uh, shed light um, uniquely on questions of how uh, how Earth-like planets get to be the way they are. You know, so how how did Venus did Venus ever have oceans, and how did how were they lost? Were Venus and Earth originally made out of the same stuff? Why doesn't Venus have plate tectonics? Um, how does it lose its heat? Uh, you know, and then, and, you know, these, these are important questions because they get to the, the rarity of Earth, you know. Um, how unusual is it for an Earth-sized planet to have plate tectonics? Uh, you know, and they, which is the driving organizing principle that, that makes Earth exist really. So, yeah. Well, even a question of how Earth-like Venus is or was, and it's going to be very hard to unravel, uh, but it's um, the most important question is the question of what was Venus like in the early solar system. Uh, did Venus, in fact, have an ocean? Pretty much everybody is now convinced it probably did. But how long did that ocean last? And if it had an ocean, uh, could it conceivably have had life in the early solar system? And yeah, and if, it, and if not, why not? Because the more we learn about early Earth... Uh, you know, the more it seems that life happened uh, instantly when conditions were right. Well, 
Everything we know about early Venus, which isn't nearly enough, tells us that uh, conditions should have been similar. Um, you know, p- people pay a lot of attention to Mars because we have better evidence for Mars. But in some ways, Venus may be, uh, you know, a more um, uh, compelling analog to the early Earth. But we just don't have the data to show that, and the data is harder to get. So, yeah, I agree. You know, the question of habitability on early Venus is essential for contextualizing habitability on Earth and Earth-like planets. But we have these three planets in the solar system, and they're so alike, but they're so different. Earth, Mars, Venus. Uh, Why are planets that seem superficially so similar, why are they so different? What's the history of them? And ultimately, what was the history of their habitable environment? But that's just one of many questions on Venus. It's yeah, there, there's a whole other there's a whole other category of question and, and and motivations, big important motivations for Venus exploration with has with climate and climate change and uh, understanding the climate uh, on Earth like planets is obviously now a question not just of academic interest but of um, you know really survival uh, for the human civilization uh, you know that level of importance and. We can't know everything we need to know about planetary climate just by studying one planet. Studying other planets gives us a reality check on our um, our prowess at modeling climate. And Venus is very interesting in particular because it's, you know, it's uh, obviously it's an extreme case of global warming, but it's also because it's an Earth-sized planet um, and one that we're getting more and more data uh, um about and, and, and one that has, you know, its own very complex climate and circulation that's very different from Earth's, you know, can we, are, we have to ask if our climate models are good enough to simulate the climate of Venus and the circulation of Venus, and right now they're not, and um, to me that says we have a lot to learn about how climate works on Earth-like planets, and so I see exploring Venus and continuing to understand its climate as an essential part of what we need to do to get better at understanding climate change on all planets, including the Earth. Now, my understanding is that one area where Venus is very different from Earth is its rotation rate is a lot slower. Uh, do we do we understand how that happened? Well, we have ideas. You know, yeah, like, I think there's, there's good theories, but there isn't actually a a good proof of the theories happening. Yeah. I mean, you know, usually when with these um, differences in rotation state and moons and things, on, we appeal to the um, the early impact history of the planets, which is, you know, it makes a lot of sense because you look at what happened on Earth to get this moon and you imagine if that collision had been slightly different, we, it would have ended up with a very different rotational state. And that's quite possibly, quite possibly what happened with Venus. But... The problem with that kind of explanation is it also seems like sort of a deus ex machina. Like, you can always invoke that and say, well, that sounds good. But as Jeff said, we, you know, we haven't proved this yet. Right. Now, how would we go about determining if Venus ever had oceans? Is, hasn't it been pretty much turned inside out quite a bit since since that era? No, 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 no. Uh, oh, 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 has it? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought you meant have we explored it in terms of yeah. early. No. Has it? Yeah, yeah. No, it, it's true. The um, the, er, the evidence for conditions on early Venus are not as obviously lying around on the surface as, say, the evidence for conditions on early Mars are lying around on the Martian surface. Yeah, Venus has been geologically active. Its surface has been reworked. And making it even harder because of the ridiculously high surface temperatures, you know, 730 Kelvin, almost uh, 900 Fahrenheit. Um, the A lot of the um, chemical and isotopic evidence might have been destroyed as well. So uh, the way we do it is through a comprehensive exploration of the surface rocks, um, of the atmosphere isotopes, of the internal structure and dynamics of the planet. You know, there's it's it's a matter of synthesizing a lot of data and getting of uh, the, the planet and its its history. Uh, you know, one thing you can look for is um, is continents like Earth style continents that are uh, made out of granite. Granite is a rock that we don't know how to make in large quantities without the presence of water. So if you find if some of the highland areas are granitic continents, as some people believe, 
then that in itself will be uh, not definitive, but strongly suggestive evidence of a of an oceanic era on Venus. Hmm. Now, I know both of you have stud for some years now have been studying future missions to Venus. Uh, uh, David, I, I don't know if, what the status is. You had a proposal in for a uh, a balloon exploration mission for some. Yeah, we have, we have uh, um, a mission. That, you know, for the last decadal survey, these uh, decadal surveys are um, something that NASA does appropriately right. once a decade <laughs> to uh, um, to kind of get the community to establish priorities uh, for future exploration. And I led a study for something called the Venus Climate Mission, which was um, a balloon mission with some other, with some drop sons, so some probes that also dropped and um, studied the uh, middle and lower um, and near surface atmosphere as well. Um, but it was mostly uh, centered on a balloon that would study the um, sort of middle atmosphere uh, and try to get a more comprehensive picture of the radiation balance and the cloud motions and the uh, chemical composition and, you know, importantly measure the uh, rare gas isotopes, which have not been well measured on Venus. Um, and um, that, that mission made the missions for the decadal survey, which was good. Unfortunately, it was not listed as the highest priority mission or the highest um, uh, two priority missions were a Mars sample return and a Europa mission, um, both of which I support strongly. Um, but, uh, you know, but it made the list. It's on that as something to be done. Um, but, um, you know, the chances of a, of a expensive Venus mission happening in the very near future, um, seem to be slim, which to me is very unfortunate. I think it's, it's it's important, and, and, and I think eventually uh, NASA's going to come around and realize the importance, uh, but it's going to take a while. But but in the meantime, there are a lot of ideas for less expensive missions that fall in the uh, discovery class. And, um, you know, there's a um, there's a round right now out of um, discovery missions. Um, and uh, because of competition sensitivity, there are certain things I cannot say uh, about that round, but it's it's clear that um, there are going to be uh, several. There, you know, there are several good ideas for what can be done on Venus in the more near term on a discovery mission budget, where you know we're talking um, a couple hundred million dollars, not a billion dollars. Uh, and um, some of those involve orbiters to do a better job um, looking at the surface with um, radar instruments and with, um, with uh, infrared instruments. And some of those involve uh, atmospheric missions, balloons, or entry probes. And, uh, you know, there is a lot that we could do on that kind of somewhat more restricted uh, uh, optimistic that uh, a Venus mission for the next round has a pretty good chance. Right. Um, well, now, what's been in the press lately has been the, the, the NASA Langley proposal. I don't know if either of you are involved in that at all, but... Uh, it's called the Havoc mission, which is a human, uh, a so-called man mission to Venus. Now, how how far? Well, first of all, let me ask you what you think about uh, the feasibility of that, and what do you, where do you think the uh, if there's any future at all for any kind of uh, uh, man mission to Venus? Well, I have to say that I really love the concept. I think it's great. But, uh, you know, send humans all across the solar system, including Venus. I've been a, a strong advocate of that. It's not something that we can do today. It's nice that they're doing the analysis, but there's a lot of detailed technology that's going to have to be worked on and demonstrated and uh, and shown to work before you're going to want to put uh, humans into, into vehicles like this. Uh, but in terms of just the fundamental concept, uh, it's great. I love it. It would be a, a wonderful thing to put uh, dirigibles and large-scale uh, atmospheric habitats into the habitat uh, in the atmosphere of Venus and, uh, you know, have people at another planet. Yeah, I agree. Um, let, let me say as an aside, I think we should retire the phrase manned mission uh, <laughs> because... Uh, 
Um, yeah, we all know what we mean, and we don't literally just mean men. But um, it's clear that uh, that is a phrase that uh, makes people feel um, excluded, and um, so I th- we should just stop using it and use um, human or people or crude or you know there isn't anything that quite sounds quite as elegant for you but human missions is pretty good but uh, I have to say I, I've never liked the word crude uh, because I'm in favor of sophisticated missions yes I, I agree I hate that word but uh, but man is problematical so maybe just human yep, indeed. Huh. but yeah okay so but yeah I think it's I think it's a great thing to scheme about and dream about, and you know there are decent arguments. I doubt it'll be the. It's not the next logical step for scientific exploration of Venus, but you know it's not really the next logical step for scientific exploration of of anywhere. There are other reasons why we send humans into space, and you know, I mean, as somebody who was uh, inspired to go into my own field by the Apollo missions, as I'm sure you know we all were to some degree. Um, then, um, you know, it's, I, I do think that, you know, as part of what we as human beings do is, is, um, you know, try to reach new realms and explore brave new worlds and, and all that stuff, uh, boldly go, um, strange new worlds. That's it. Um, but, but, um, yeah, so, um, I, and there, there is a, a way you could imagine the scientific utility, um, Mark Bullock and I, um, at, at one of the VEEKSAG, uh, the Venus Exploration Activity Group meetings, uh, several years ago, um, uh, got up and made a sort of, you know, modest proposal to, um, yeah, we should send humans, um, because eventually, not the next step, but a future step, we're going to want to do remotely operate this. Uh, and so one thing to do is put humans either in orbit or in, in, in the clouds to operate those, just as we have people on ships operating remotely operated vehicles and on the ocean, exploring the ocean depths of Earth. And, you know, as, as, um, as Jeffrey mentioned, uh, you know, just as we don't want to, it's hard to put a sophisticated computer at the surface to run your rover. Well, it's hard to put a human brain at the surface to run your remotely operated vehicle, but up in the, up in the higher atmosphere or orbit, that's a fine place. And at some point, I think there will be a scientific motivation to do that. Yeah, I agree. Uh, the idea of, Chile operation of full capability for rovers on the surface, it's not out of the question. Our technology for high temperature electronics is evolving very rapidly. And by the time we can put people in dirigible or other habitats in the atmosphere, uh, we will have the robots that can live on the surface. And the idea that, well, you have the humans right there and they can operate on the surface in pretty much full virtual reality. They're there, they're operating the teller robot, but they have complete presence. Uh, you could do that. That would be a wonderful way to explore. And, and one point that may seem obvious to us, but is worth mentioning for the listeners, is that the reason why we want to do this from from Venus, even up in the atmosphere or orbit, but not from Earth, is because of the time delay uh, which, uh, at Venus difference, distance, at Venus distances from Earth is significant enough so that it would affect the ability to do, um, these kind of operations. But if you're operating from upper atmosphere, then obviously it's close enough to instantaneous. Yeah, exactly. It's all, uh, up the length being from Earth, you're programming a robot, but the robot does the exploration. If you were operating from the atmosphere, you would really be virtually present. That would be how all the present. So it's a, a big difference. The same as being there, but it really would be the next best thing. No. In fact, it would. In fact, it would be better. <laughs> in some ways, you'd have expanded senses. Well, I'd also be more comfortable than being on the surface. Uh, well, that is probably true. Well, tell tell me about the hazards of of exploring Venus. If if we send humans there, it, is the atmosphere a safe place to to be? Is it? Or are there storms or other environmental phenomena that could threaten humans? Well, it's not entirely a safe place. It would probably not be quite as safe as sitting home and watching television. Uh, <laughs> because it is a somewhat dynamic atmosphere. Uh, you sort of think of it, oh, you're floating in the, in the atmosphere. But uh, that atmosphere is moving around the planet. It's uh, 100 meters a, a second, it, it's moving very quickly. And there's probably going to be some turbulence uh, in that atmosphere. 
the balloon mission to Venus uh, quite a while back, the, uh, the Vega mission, uh, did show a bit of turbulence. So you're going to have to, uh, you're not going to be just sitting, uh, sitting floating freely. Yeah, I think, I think, um, that, that's right. I think there are altitudes and latitudes, um, where you could, uh, avoid, certainly avoid the worst of the turbulence and that might, might require, um, navigation to the point where, um, you know, there's, uh, you, you see that, um, a couple of days down the road at this particular latitude, there's, um, some, um, likely turbulence and you, um, either, you know, steer to a higher altitude or, um, somewhat different latitude, uh, rather than just completely passively floating around if you really want to avoid the worst of it. But that's, that's right. It's not going to be an entirely smooth ride, but certainly, um, it could be done and I think it could be withstood by, by humans and it, uh, might be, uh, much desirable to, uh, conditions in the lower atmosphere. There is, of course, the, the acid nature of the clouds. Um, you wouldn't want to just like step outside on the, um, you know, on the, on the deck without some protective clothing. And obviously you need air to breathe, but that wouldn't be that hard to provide. We, you've talked about some of the, dis- the discovery missions that are, uh, being looked at now. Uh, where do you guys think the next step really is, say, in the next generation? And what can we really learn about Venus, or how what how more much more sophisticated can our questions become? Well, one thing we're going to have to do. I mean, this next round of missions will not really require um, any new technology. The the um, you know the um, sensors have gotten better um, since we went to Venus um, with, uh, say, Pioneer Venus in the '70s. So we'll, we could do a lot more with less in terms of better instruments. We know because of pre- previous instruments, we know what to to ask and what instruments to send now. But in terms of really the next leap, as uh, Jeff Minter, you know, we 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 are going to need to uh, go operate on the surface in some way. We want to do seismic networks. We want to know what's going on, the, the interior structure and dynamics of the planet. To do that, you need to operate on the surface, um, possibly for, for months, and that will take some technology development. And then ultimately, um, you know, I love these ideas of uh, airplanes and rovers and the kinds of uh, things that, that um, Jeff has, has written about um, to really do the, the next level in-depth um, kind of exploration of this very complex and intriguing planet. And to do all that, we're going to have to develop new technology and then, you know, uh, test it to the point where it has the, uh, the readiness to operate in that environment. Hmm. And, and the, the scientific, qu- what's the scientific question you think we can answer first? Well, so well, first, um, there's a lot of questions and we can address many of them if we can put seismic networks on the surface of Venus. And I think that's quite doable. Uh, we start learning something completely new, and that's the question, what's underneath the crust of Venus? Is it a thick crust? Is it a thin crust? Is it an active crust? Is it, uh, does it have earthquakes? And that would tell us uh, a lot about the fundamental nature of Venus. Yeah, and especially this whole question of, well, if Venus doesn't appear, it seems not to have plate tectonics, but plate tectonics is how Earth loses its heat. And Venus is the same size, so pre- pre- presumably has the same amount, roughly, internal heat so what's venus doing with its heat how's it working and yeah that's that's what you know a seismic network will help us to get at some of these big picture questions of how this sort of alternate earth level and here's another scientific question that you could answer by going down to the surface that i find personally just a fascinating uh question the radar images of venus show that the mountaintops above about Oh, five kilometers or so are are white. They're very reflective. So, what is the nature of this apparent snow that seems to cover the top of Venus Mountain? Uh, that would be something we could just go down and take a look and say, what is it? Uh, what's depositing on these uh, these mountain tops? One thing we know for sure is that it's not snow. Yeah, and, and, and another huge question is, uh, you know, we mentioned it earlier, but is uh, you know, speaking of mountains on Venus and and the volcanoes, are they active? We need to definitively 
answer that and how active? Uh, you know, this is an exciting question because most other uh, rocky planets are are geologically dead in terms of, you know, internally generated geological activity. We're sort of doing forensic geology when we go to Mars and the moon and Mercury and looking at things that happened billions of years ago. But Venus quite likely is active today and we could study ongoing geological processes and watch volcanoes erupting and, um, you know, monitor earthquakes as they're, or Venus quakes <laughs> as they're happening. So, um, you know, but again, to really do that well, we're going to have to um, brave that near surface environment. And for, for that last one, perhaps with um, some kind of uh, remotely operated um, aircraft that can um, do surface imaging from low altitudes at a lot of different locations. Hmm. Part of the have carry the plumes that act as volcanoes and see what they're emitting. Uh, and that would be a, a job for low altitude aircraft, which is tricky, but not ever involved. Tricky, but you can do it, Jeff. We're counting on you. <laughs> Uh, David, how about those uh, chemical disequilibrium that are observed in the atmosphere? Can we can we get to a point where we can understand them and maybe even study the astrobiological implications? Yeah, well, the, I mean, they actually the um, the observation that Jeff just mentioned, which is um, really looking at volcanic plumes, is key to that question. You know, we suspect that a lot of the atmospheric disequilibria today has to do with um, the cycles that are driven, the chemical cycles that are driven by active volcanism. You know, sulfur in particular is a gas that uh, is doing funny things in the upper atmosphere. In fact, the, the clouds of Venus, which are dominate the uh, view from space and dominate the, so much about the planet, um, shouldn't be there. Uh, we allowed the atmosphere to come to equilibrium and we start to minerals. You would think that a lot of that sulfur would would sort of be pulled out of the atmosphere. So we think it's being actively driven by uh, volcanoes, but we're not entirely sure about that. So, um, and then, you know, any possible astrobiological implications of that chemical equilibria, that, you know, that biology, if it's there, would be riding along on those chemical gradients that are ultimately driven by um, geological activity just as on Earth, the biology sort of rides along on um, chemistry planet that is driven both by geology and by um, energy from the sun. So, you know, if you want to get at what's happening from an astrobiological point of view, you have to first um, understand what's happening chemically um, by the, you know, the just the natural geophysical processes and chemical processes of the planet. So we need to understand the volcanism and um, what's happening in the atmosphere driven by sunlight. And in order to do that, we just have to do all these kinds of exploration we've been talking about. Right. Now, what would a, what would a Venus airplane look like? How high would it fly? And I mean, well, the Venus airplanes, the Venus airplanes we've been looking at have been solar powered airplanes. Uh, interestingly enough, we're talking about regions in the Venus atmosphere for many of these airplanes that are very similar to the flying conditions on Earth. So they wouldn't look too different from Earth airplanes. Uh, we are talking about airplanes that would fly very fast. We want to fly faster than the local wind. Uh, so these are not slow biplanes that are sort of poking around. But they're, uh, they're pretty zippy little airplanes. Uh, but the great thing is you can do that on Venus because there's once you're above the clouds, there's plenty of solar energy. So you have lots of power to run your solar-powered airplane. So the main feature, if you were looking at the solar-powered airplane, uh, well, the first is that they would look sort of origami uh, because they can fold out together. If you fold them up into a little aeroshell, drop them into the atmosphere, and then they unfold. Uh, but once they're unfolded, the first thing you'll notice is those wings are covered with solar cells <laughs> because that's the, uh, that's the way they get there. I'm sorry, I think, are you still there? Uh, yeah, I'm still here. Okay. Uh, now, uh, does this exploit the fact that Venus rotates so slowly you can you can stay in the sun all the time just by flying around? Uh, it does partly, uh, but of course 
the atmosphere of Venus rotates much faster than the planet does. Right. That's one of the sort of mysteries of Venus. So why does the atmosphere uh, rotate around in four days? So the planet takes much, much longer to, to go around. So you not only have to go faster than the rotation of the same in the sun, you're going to have to move faster than the atmosphere. Hmm. And, and so you're, the the designs we're looking at, their their speed is driven by just trying to stay in the sun. Is that if if you want to stay in the sun, indeed. An alternative, of course, is if you can float or perhaps operating on batteries, uh, you can go around the night side and be sort of dormant, and then when the the sun comes up again, uh, as you go around on the day side, you turn on and say, "Hey, if uh, sunlight can fly around." Ah, okay. Yes. Well, battery technology is getting a lot better, so there's some hope for that uh so now these, these kinds of uh uh planes would be uh would they be serving as primarily as communications relays or they also have a scientific mission oh oh absolutely you can do science from airplanes there's a lot of uh, interesting science you can do so there's two possible things you can use them as communications relays in that case you have to stay stationary over a particular point uh, on the surface or you can use them as scientific platforms, so like, for example, climbing up to high altitudes and trying to sample some of the ultraviolet absorbers, some of the mysterious particles in the atmosphere of, of Venus, and do the chemical measurement and the analysis, perhaps, of volcanic plumes, learning about atmospheric motion, learning about climate, uh, all of these things. There's a lot you can learn with... Uh, atmospheric exploration by airplane. So yeah. it, it would be I agree that as you know, as as a scientist, there, there there's a lot that, a lot of big questions we still have about the um, the cloud level atmosphere in addition to the the atmosphere below and above the clouds. You know, we've had um, a handful of entry probes, but as um, you know, as we've learned with, Gene, with with Venus Express, it's it's such a uh, variable atmosphere. That handful of entry probes just don't tell us what we need to know. There's so much going on in that atmosphere that is mysterious to us. And so, uh, you know, one of those airplanes, if you could fly around in the clouds and sample cloud particles in different places and measure the radiation flux and measure the winds. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously the rare gases is something we need to do from within the atmosphere that's very important for these evolutionary questions. Um, and then if you could fly around at somewhat lower altitudes um, and image the surface, especially in the infrared, the near-infrared, I just think there's a, a huge scientific potential if you could get those uh, aerial vehicles in the atmosphere of Venus. Hmm. Uh, okay. The uh, One last question that I have from, the, from listeners, which is a, a popular question, but... I know you're going to, it, it could be a struggle to answer it, which is, uh, is there any, is there any way that we know of to get humans exploring the surface, uh, in person? Well, I think with technologies that we understand, but don't yet have developed, uh, to be ready, you could, if you wanted to, send humans to the surface in something that would essentially be a bathosphere, a big pressure vessel that could sort of descend down and you could say, hey, here we are on the surface of the Venus, and maybe even look out through a window, although windows are, are tough when you're at this, this pressure and temperature. But I'm not sure if that would be a very, very satisfying experience. Mm -hmm. uh, you you wouldn't really be on the surface because you'd be separated from the surface by uh, a shell of insulated material that could be a, a foot thick. So it would be very much like the early exploration of the ocean bottom with bathospheres where uh, you were down there, but you didn't uh, didn't really have much of an experience. Yeah, as, as Jeff put it earlier, um, you know, we wouldn't need new physics, but we would certainly need a lot of new technology exploiting the physics we know. And, and and I agree, it would be a strange and not that satisfying experience. In fact, you know, it raises interesting philosophical questions about what we mean by direct experience. If you consider the experience, say, of a human 
uh, um, at cloud level with really sophisticated uh, virtual reality telepresence on the surface, you know, seeing things, some other kind of immersive um, display and experiencing the environment that versus a human who is actually, um, you know, technically there on the surface, but as, as Jeffrey put it, you know, looking out some window that's a foot thick with, in a very restricted environment, you know, which one of those is really a more, quote, real experience of the environment? Um, I, I'm not sure it's necessarily um, the, or a more immediate experience. I'm not who is technically there. And, uh, you know, so it's, it's just an interesting thing to ponder what we really require in terms of having to be there versus, um, having to, you know, being able to experience it various technological interfaces. Okay. Um, anything else, anything else on Venus that you think the public really should know about what, what questions don't they ask you enough? Well, I mean, one, one thing is, uh, it's worth pointing out is just, you know, I, or reiterating is that Venus is an underexplored planet right now. And, um, the level of exploration, the level of resources we put into exploring it, and we are currently putting into exploring it does not match the intrinsic interest and importance of the questions that can be answered there, either just the human interest questions of where do we come from? What's, you know, the meaning of life? Literally, we can address these things by understanding the uh, emergence of life on Earth compared to a similar planet that's gone down a different path. Um, and, and, you know, the, the scientific questions of, um, you know, of how Earth-like planets work. This is also, a, I think, a beautiful and mysterious and varied place to explore that once people really know about it there and, and know about the importance i think ultimately there will be a clamoring for more venus exploration because there's just a big hole in our knowledge and, and ultimately what we need is not just a series of these relatively inexpensive missions that we're proposing for now although i very much support them but we do need a venus program like um we currently have a mars program and, uh, you know, we're, we're certainly capable of doing this. It's a political question, and Mars has a lot of momentum, and I certainly support the Mars program. I don't think that we need to do one at the expense of the other. But it is my um, hope and my belief that ultimately, as um, these questions uh, just, um, you know, they're not going to go away, these questions. And as we start to learn about Earth-like exoplanets, it's just going to become that much more apparent that if we're interested in Earth-like, Earth-sized planets and knowing how they tick and being able to even interpret the exoplanets that we start to learn about that are Earth-sized, we have no choice but to go back to Venus with a more sophisticated program of exploration. So I, I think that's going to happen and that all of these things we've been talking about, um, some of them farther in the future than others, but I, I, I think we are going to going to do these things and you know i would like to live to see as much of it as, as i can great the more we learn about planets always what we discover is there's mysteries that we haven't even contemplated yet so we've only barely begun to scratch the surface of being once we learn more about it we're going to discover wow here's uh exciting scientific questions that we have we have no uh, idea David, there's one more thing I have to ask you. Since we talked last a couple of years ago, you were working on a book. Yeah. And uh, I'm one of the many fans of your books. And, and uh, we talked to Stephen Dick last summer, and he said that you were working on your book down the hall from him. Uh, yeah, uh, Steve, and I, Steve and I were um, – I had offices next door to each other. Um, uh, and, um, uh, that was really a wonderful experience getting to, uh, interact so much with, uh, with, uh, with Steve who was one of my, he's one of my, uh, sign, one of my scholarly heroes on the history of, of, uh, astrobiology. And, um, yeah, I'm still, um, still working on the book, although it's, um, nearing completion. It's due at the publisher, um, this spring and will probably be out, um, in early 2016 on, um, uh, Hatchet books and um it's about the um the anthropocene epoch as seen um from a planetary science and astrobiology perspective in other words if we look at 
our moment on Earth geologically, the transition that Earth is going through now as a result of human activity, if we look at that as astrobiologists and planetary scientists, how does that transition look? Right. And then how does that perspective hopefully inform uh, us in a useful way and inform our choices? And uh, so, um, yeah, that's uh, it's still a work in progress, although progress is being made daily. Yes. Well, I, uh, I'm looking forward to it, and uh, and uh, we'll uh, certainly let our listeners know when it's out. Okay. And maybe we'll have you back on to I talk about it. That. <laughs> I would love to do that. Thanks. I appreciate the interest, and I, um, uh, I'd love to come and uh, talk to you about that uh, in, a, uh, in a few months when, when it's done. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, um, any f- closing remarks before I let you guys go? Let's go explore Venus. This is fun. I think we should uh, we should take us on the road. Venus, Venus and Palooza. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. It's an exciting planet. Let's go explore it. All right. Thank you very much, gentlemen. All right. Uh, thanks. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks to David Grinspoon and Jeffrey Landis for appearing on the WOW Signal again and giving us some real insight into what makes sense for Venus exploration and why. I'd also like to thank the Space subreddit for their interest and questions. I merged their questions with my own for this interview. If after listening to this you still have questions, let us know, and we'll get them answered if at all possible. You can email Podcast at gmail.com, or come on the blog at wowsignalpodcast.com. We also have a G Plus community, a Facebook page, and a subreddit. We'd also like to hear what you think about Venus exploration or any of the other topics we cover on the Wow Signal. We're looking for your ideas about what we should do next and who should be on the show. I hope that if you have not done so already, you will listen to the last episode, episode 9, and hear what we're thinking about engaging our listening audience and learning from their comments and suggestions. I recorded this episode with my trusty old Zoom H2N as a USB mic. I hope it sounds okay. We're moving house, so my other podcasting gear is hard to get at to it set up right now. Come March, everything should be back to normal, and that is when I will be looking to start on another full-length episode. The plan right now is to have Jose Galache, one of our expert commentators, in episode 8, back to talk about asteroid mining. We'll have someone else join him there, although that person is not yet identified. We're also planning to do an episode soon involving young people. I'm looking for a panel of middle schoolers who want to ask thoughtful questions about careers in space and becoming an astronaut. If you are interested in participating, email me. Another near-term ambition is to do a listener roundtable episode. It's your chance to sound off on any or all the topics we cover on the WOW Signal. Leave a comment or post letting us know if you are interested and what time zone you are in. I hope to have five or six listeners when we do this. And now, the nagging and begging segment. For all the links you will need, go to wowsignalpodcast.com. For each show, we have a set of detailed show notes, rich in linkage. Now, there are many causes and even some other podcasts deserving of your support, so we don't ask for much of your available cash. After all, there are diseases to cure, there is misinformation to counter, science to do, and there are hungry people to feed. Most of your giving should be in that direction, I think. However, $1 per episode of the WOW Signal at patreon.com slash wow signal wouldn't do any measurable damage. That's at most $4 per month, probably more like $2 on average, 
We don't bill patrons for the new bursts. If you don't like that idea, you can just go to cafepress.com and order a t-shirt or a coffee mug or some such. As we stated last time, our number one objective for 2015 is more listener engagement. Only you can make that happen. Please visit our online communities, links in the show notes at wowsignalpodcast.com as always, and engage with us. Let us know what you think, what your questions are, how we could get better, and who would you, you would like to hear on the show. So, you know what we need now? We need another George Robb song. Until next time. As sure as the star-bellied sneeches butter the underside of their toast. All things being equal, the simplest answers worth most. Don't rely on Vishnu, Buddha, Ron Popeil, or the Holy Ghost. Just consider these words, and that ship of life you're sailing on might not smash into the coast.
when you can't laugh at yourself, you just end up crying. Think for yourself, little friend. Is it you that they like? Or is it the money you spend? Beware of the jerks who'd rather break than bend. And to question anything to them is just like dying. Yeah, it's like dying. the wow signal a podcast produced by the dream of the open channel please visit wowsignalpodcast.com for more information all music presented on this podcast is either creative commons or is presented with the permission of the artist the wow signal is distributed under the creative commons attribution share alike license